This is Ran Ran from OHSU bringing you a talk short on toxin-induced bradycardias. But instead of going into the toxins, I'm going to take another approach. It's easy when the patient can tell you what they took and the quantity. You consult toxicology and do an up-to-date search on the topic. But what if your patient is so hemodynamically unstable that they cannot talk to you and no pill bottles are found nearby? When should you suspect toxin as a culprit? What should you do about it? This talk, therefore, is not about toxic bradycardia. It's actually about plain old bradycardia, focusing on the more interesting variant, the undifferentiated, hypotensive, and unstable patient. The true resuscitationist has to think through etiologies, obtain a rapid evaluation, and apply empiric treatment for the unstable patient. Differential for bradycardia presenting from the outpatient setting is quite long. I break it down to the following hypoxia and hypothermia, which you can rapidly detect by performing a full set of vitals. Hyperkalemia, acidosis, which is also rapidly detectable through point of care labs. Heart block and MI, which is usually pretty evident on EKG. There are cardiac reflexes, like the Jarrus Bezel reflex, which is when the heart feels like it's underfilled and slows its beat to compensate. This is the physiologic basis of vasovagal syncope but can also present in the setting of large PE, tamponade, severe dehydration, and aortic dissection from an underfilled atria. There's also endocrine disorders like hypothyroidism and Addison's. You'll have to rely on labs for this one. And there are neurological reflexes, like Cushing's reflex of the brain, though this is usually hypertensive, or neurogenic shock from epidural abscess or trauma. Lastly, consider toxins. The four classes of toxins that induce bradycardia include cholinergics, clonidine, digoxin, beta blocker, and calcium channel blockers. Unfortunately, there are no labs or drug screens that can help you out here. Only history and physical will clue you in. This is what makes toxin-induced bradycardia so difficult. The treatment must happen concurrently, before you fully know what's going on. Feel free to follow the ACLS algorithm, which includes doing nothing if the patient's not symptomatic, and try an atropine if they are. We are specifically talking about the hypotensive, sick-appearing bradycardic patient. This automatically puts them in the symptomatic group. ACLS also offers transcutaneous pacing, transvenous pacing, dopamine, and epi drips as all acceptable therapies. Pragmatically though, transcutaneous pacing is very finicky, unreliable, and not well tolerated. I reserve this only for the unstable patient who has no reliable IV access, and I don't have an IO drill nearby. Transvenous pacing takes a while to set up, at least 20 to 30 minutes in experienced hands. Chemical pacing is usually the fastest to set up and best tolerated. ACLS recommends epidrip or dopamine drip for chemical pacing. I personally favor push dose epi over drips in the acutely unstable patients. Drips take a while to set up, time to titrate to effect, and occupy a line, precious real estate in the unstable patient. To make push dose epi, take a 10 mil saline flush, eject 1 mil, and draw 1 mil out of your code card epi. This makes 10 micrograms per mil of push dose epi. You can now administer 20 mics in 2 mil pushes of this epi dose through a peripheral IV and observe for a response. If this works, great start the epi trip. If not, you need higher doses of push dose epi, 40 micrograms, 80 micrograms. From that point, just use a code cart epi, which has 100 mics of epi per mil, and administer that in one to two mils at a time, every five minutes. Epi has no ceiling dose, whereas dopamine does. Lastly, the old adage that dopamine is safe through a peripheral IV, whereas epi is not, has been disproven. Atropine and epi will work for most causes of bradycardia by stimulating the pacemaker cells at the SA node and the AV node directly. If these therapies don't work, they actually help to narrow your differential to etiologies that interrupt the heart below the AV node. So you take that original list. You ruled out hypoxia and hypothermia because you got a full set of vitals and are treating appropriately. You've ruled out hyperkalemia and acidosis thanks to your point of care labs. You've obtained an EKG, which shows no obvious MI and no obvious heart block. 
If there is a high degree heart block below the AV node, this is a good time to strongly consider transvenous pacing and get set up for this. The Jarrett Spiesel reflex, hypothyroidism, adrenal crisis, Cushing's reflex, neurogenic shock, they will all respond to epinephrine. Of the toxins, cholinergic toxicity and clonidine overdose will both respond to atropine or epinephrine. And actually, most digoxin, beta blocker, and calcium channel blocker overdoses will too, but the severe ones will not. And these can be some of the sickest patients you will ever see. To summarize, if atropine and epi did not work, then you are dealing with high degree heart block or etiologies affecting the myocytes at a cellular level. Dig, beta blocker, and calcium channel blockers can cause refractory bradycardia because they act on the cellular level. As a primer, this is a very basic schematic representation of a non-pacemaker myocyte. Sodium channels facilitate depolarization, which cause calcium to flux in as well. The elevated intracellular calcium triggers the ranodidine receptors on the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release stored calcium. Calcium causes myocardial contraction. Calcium is also very important in a variety of other cell processes like metabolism. Beta receptors catalyze this process. Its activation stimulates G proteins and then cyclic AMP, followed by PKA, which phosphorylates L-type calcium channels. This allows more calcium to flux in. PKA also phosphorylates the phosphoamban channels, which stores calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum to allow for more calcium to flux out during the next contraction. Beta blockers, therefore, inhibit this pathway. And so the net effect is decreased intracellular calcium in all of your cells. In the myocyte, this means decreased contractility, decreased automaticity, because the pacemaker cells of your heart uses calcium for its spontaneous depolarization and also shifts the myocyte metabolism away from free fatty acids and lactate and instead to carbohydrates. Lipophilic beta blockers like propanolol can cross the blood-brain barrier and decrease intracellular calcium in neurons causing seizures and comas. Decreased intracellular calcium in smooth muscles cause profound vasoplegia and hypotension. Unlike beta blockers, which indirectly inhibits the L-type calcium channels, calcium channel blockers block them directly. This results in a clinical picture very similar to beta blockers, vasoplegia, decreased contractility, and decreased automaticity. There's also shifting of the fuel source to carbohydrates as well. Calcium channel blockers also block the PI3K pathway and can induce insulin resistance. Lastly, L-type calcium channels are also found on the pancreas and necessary for the release of insulin. So calcium channel blockers cause a clinical picture that is very similar to beta blockers. They both decrease intracellular calcium. But unlike beta blockers, calcium channel blockers can also induce hyperglycemia from decreased insulin secretions and increased insulin resistance. This combined with a shifting of myocardial fuel supply to carbohydrates from free fatty acids and lactate worsens the metabolic supply to myocytes. Digoxin works through a very different mechanism. Instead of lowering intracellular calcium, it actually increases it. It does so indirectly by blocking the NAK ATPase. This impairs repolarization and increases intracellular sodium. This impairs the ability for the sodium calcium channel to work in exporting calcium and therefore causes increased intracellular calcium. This is how digoxin increases contractility in patients with heart failure. The increased calcium also causes increased automaticity in both the atria and ventricles, and you can see a lot of PACs and PVCs. The pacemaker cells in the atria are driven by calcium flux. An increased intracellular calcium here can actually speed up atrial depolarization, unveiling rapid AFib and atrial flutter. However, this usually does not conduct to the ventricles because of delayed repolarization, as well as increased vagal tone from increased intracellular calcium in the vagus nerves. So this will manifest as rapid atrial beats with a very slow ventricular rhythm. 
The delayed repolarization can also cause a very slurred and cupped ST segments. Lastly, intracellular calcium can cause delayed after depolarization. A spontaneous depolarization from elevated calcium before another action potential has been transmitted. This looks like U waves or biventricular tachycardia. Let's simplify this whole thing. Because even though the pathophysiology is interesting, there's little time or mental energy to expend during the resuscitation of an acutely ill patient. You started with an unstable bradycardic patient. You get a full set of vitals, and there is no hypoxia or hypothermia. You establish immediate IV or IO access. You gave them atropine, no effect. Then, escalating doses of push-dose epi every five minutes, no effect. You get a point-of-care blood gas with lights, normal potassium and normal pH. You review the EKG, and there is no sign of STEMI or complete heart block. You are considering a transvenous pacer, but understand now that you are dealing with refractory bradycardia. The reversible causes are severe DIG or severe beta blocker and calcium channel blocker toxicity. There is a high mortality to both, partly because the diagnosis and treatment are often delayed, hence the purpose of this talk. So the next question to ask is, is this digoxin? Because you don't want to pace or use calcium if it is. Pacing an already hypercalcemic and irritable myocyte can precipitate more unstable rhythms. Giving calcium can theoretically worsen digoxin overdose by further increasing intracellular calcium. If you suspect a joxin, draw a dig level, but also empirically administer two vials of dig oxin immune fab push. You can forget all about dig oxin immune fab after until the dig level comes back. By that time, elicit help from a toxicologist for further dosing. ACLS actually recommends giving 10 to 20 vials in a code or near code situation. But this makes very little sense and will cost more than $150,000 for empiric treatment. Two vials should bind all intravascular digoxin, if there even is any. The other thing about digoxin overdose is that hypokalemia can potentiate its toxic effects. Supplement potassium and magnesium. It will take 15 to 30 minutes for digoxin immune fab to take effect. So continue to use push dose epi and move on to the next treatment pathway. The next treatment pathway assumes beta blocker and calcium channel blocker overdose. The key here is to go quickly through these treatments, bolus meds, and do not delay to start a drip. Do not delay to intubate unless there's an immediate threat on the airway. Do not delay to place a central line. Too often, these patients are left to languish in a cardiogenic shock state, hypotensive and bradycardic for hours. We will go over the individual treatments next, but quickly, push glucagon five milligrams over five minutes. If that didn't work, push calcium gluconate. If that didn't work, push one unit per kilogram of insulin as a bolus, and an AMPA D50 if their starting blood sugar was less than 250. And if all of that didn't work, push intralipid, 100 mL bolus over five minutes. Notice that each step is five minutes, so ideally you will have every step done by 30 minutes of meeting this acutely ill and dying patient. To focus on the individual therapies, glucagon is supposed to work by raising intracellular levels of cyclic AMP and thereby increase intracellular calcium. We were taught in medical school that this is the antidote for beta blocker overdose. The reality is that data for its efficacies are very poor. If the initial dose of glucagon shows improvement, then repeat boluses and a drip at a higher dose can be considered. But if it does not, do not perseverate on this step and move on. Some providers even opt to skip this step because of its questionable efficacy and its high risk of inducing vomiting. It also doesn't have a role in calcium channel blocker overdose. Trying some calcium is of little harm and makes sense in beta blocker and calcium channel overdose, but it can theoretically worsen digoxin overdose because there's already too much calcium in the myocyte. This therapy too probably has very minimal effect. It is difficult to overcome the downstream blockade by elevating extracellular calcium. 
try it once, and then move on. Beta adrenergy makes a lot of sense. Given the blockade, you will need rather high doses, higher than you are used to. High dose insulin is very efficacious in calcium channel blocker overdose. The data is less convincing for beta blocker overdose, but high dose insulin is helpful for heart failure in general by increasing inotropy through alternative mechanisms. It also helps feed the myocardium by increasing the delivery of glucose in the setting of shifted fuel source. In animal studies, high-dose insulin euglycemic therapy provides inotropy, but also vasodilation at the tissue level. Consequently, you might not see an improvement in blood pressure or heart rate, but there is an improvement to perfusion via both increased cardiac contractility and improved flow to tissues such as the coronary and the pulmonary vasculature. There is also an improvement in survival. Intralipid acts as a sink for lipid soluble beta blocker and calcium channel blockers, decreasing the free molecules in the serum. It also shuttles toxins from the serum to the liver. Lastly, it can act as a source of fuel to the starved myocardium. The biggest downside to intralipid is that it impairs photometric lab testing once it's given. Remember the mega bleach mnemonic. Magnesium, glucose, blood gases, liver transaminases, electrolytes, analgesic levels like Tylenol level and salicylate level, coax, H&H and &H platelets, basically everything useful. This can make your high-dose insulin plan particularly difficult to manage because of the requirement for close CBG monitoring as well as potassium monitoring. These labs can still be obtained reliably with electrochemical methods, but you'll have to check with your lab. If you got through all of these therapies in the first 30 minutes, kudos to you. This patient will obviously need the ICU because the next steps involves starting a whole load of drips. The drips usually involve starting or continuing the patients on dopamine, starting or continuing the patient on an epi drip. If the glucagon bolus worked, you can start a drip at two milligrams per hour. After the insulin bolus, you should start the patient on regular insulin drip at one unit per kilogram per hour, along with a D10 drip to keep the CBG between 100 to 200. You can continue to bolus 100 ml of intralipid as needed for a total maximum of eight boluses or start an infusion at 100 ml per hour for up to seven hours. The more advanced management strategy relies on the use of bedside ultrasound or invasive cardiac monitoring. The premise is that driving pressure equals heart rate times stroke volume times systemic vascular resistance. We know that the blood pressure and the heart rate are low but it is unclear without echo or invasive monitoring the stroke volume or the systemic vascular resistance. Echo can approximate stroke volume through EF determinations via E-point septal separation or fractional shortening. Systemic vascular resistance is best calculated with invasive monitoring, like with a SWAN or PICO. Alternatively, you can calculate SVR using the SVO2 or using echo approximations. The poor man's version is simply to check cap refills and feel the temperature of the extremities relative to the core. Prolonged cap refills or cool hands and feet indicate a high SVR. There are four possible scenarios. The stroke volume is low and the SVR is low. This scenario is best served by more inotropic vasopressors, inopressors. Keep escalating epidosis. High-dose insulin can be useful because it works through a different mechanism, but understand that it is an inodilator. The second scenario is that the stroke volume is low, but the SVR is high. An inodilator is an even better agent here. Keep escalating insulin boluses and drip dose. Consider adding milrinone or dobutamine and backing off of the epinephrine. The third scenario is that the stroke volume is okay, but the SVR is very low. Here, a pure vasopressor is best served. Potent vasopressors include epinephrine, dopamine, norepinephrine, and phenylephrine. The fourth scenario is that the stroke volume is okay, but the SVR is very high. 
This means that the bradycardia is purely responsible for hypotension and you will need a chronodilator. Consider transvenous pacing if there is low likelihood of digoxin overdose. Dobutamine, milrinone, and isoproteranol can help in these cases. It can be daunting to order 10 times the dose of normal insulin. Logistically though, it is very simple if the glucose and potassium are monitored closely. This therapy is also very safe and well tolerated. After a bolus of one unit per kilogram of regular insulin, inject regular insulin 500 units into 500 mils of normal saline. This produces one unit per mil of insulin and drip this at a rate of one mil per kg per hour. If the CBG is low, i.e. less than 250, give one amp of D50. Else, check the blood glucose every 30 minutes and give D10 water to maintain euglycemia. There have been case reports of giving up to a thousand units of regular insulin without needing to give dextrose in the patients with severe calcium channel blocker overdose because of the degree of insulin resistance. Continue to check the CBGs every 30 minutes until the CBG is consistently 100 to 200 for four hours before switching this to Q1 hour. Check the potassium every hour as well because of the potential to induce severe hypokalemia. This needs to be supplemented aggressively. After starting high-dose insulin, reassess with bedside echo every 30 minutes. This is how long it takes for the therapy to take effect. There's usually not an improvement in heart rate or even blood pressure. Monitor instead the ejection fraction, urine output, mental status, and your pressure requirements. Follow up with your toxicologist thereafter but it usually involves increasing insulin boluses and drip rates every 30 minutes until effect. There are a few unique toxicologic considerations. The first strategy is always to limit absorption. Gastric lavage and activated charcoal can be considered if the patient is already intubated and specifically presenting within an hour of ingestion. Some, however, may consider extending this window if it's a massive ingestion of extended release formulations. I will talk to your toxicologist. The second strategy is to consider enhancing elimination. However, whole bowel irrigation in these patients are unsafe because of their high dose pressure requirements and the concern for gut ischemia. These drugs are typically not dialyzable, except atenolol, which is very water soluble. The third step is to consider antidotes. Digoxin, obviously, has the antidote of digoxin immune fab. Beta blocker and calcium channel blockers really have no antidotes. Clonidine has a theoretical antidote of adipamazole, but this is approved for animal use only. The fourth strategy is to try and decrease free drug, and lipid emulsion therapy can accomplish this for you, but remember, it really messes with your photometric testing, so use it as a last resort. And lastly, supportive management. From an airway perspective, these patients generally need intubation because of their depressed mental status. However, remember the ketamine, the tomate, propofol, they all depress the myocyte. So you should treat the shock first. And when intubating, because they're already altered, consider low-dose fentanyl and Versed for sedation. For breathing, clonidine can cause respiratory depression and apnea and you would support this with mechanical ventilation as needed. For circulation, well, that was the bulk of this talk. But to review, for the hypotensive bradycardic patient, you can give them atropine, push-dose epinephrine, dopamine, and if these therapies don't work, then recognize that you are dealing with the refractory hypotensive bradycardic patient. And the question you need to ask is, is this digoxin? Because if it is, give them two vials of digoxin immune fab. Continue the push dose epinephrine. You can also give glucagon push, followed by insulin bolus, and lastly, intralipid. Thanks for tuning in to Talk Shorts. We'll see you next time.